Living Seed Media brings to you God's Word, which is His comprehensive equipment for changing lives. May the Lord impact your heart as you encounter His Word. For further inquiry or counsel, contact Peace House, P.O. Box 971, Boko, Benue State, Nigeria. Telephone numbers 0703 036369 0703 768 98 Email address lsmedia at or visit our website at www.livingseed.org Let us sit back and listen as the servant of God brings forth the word of life. I'm going to read a couple of verses because I want to be dealing with setting the agenda for the future. Setting the agenda for the coming days. The book of uh, Jeremiah 29 says, I know the thoughts that I have towards you. Can we read Jeremiah 29 before we go ahead? Jeremiah 29 and verse 11 says, For I know the plans I have for you declares the Lord. Plans for welfare and not for evil. To give you a future and a hope. Can I read that again? For I know the plans that I have for you. Declares the Lord plans for welfare and not for evil to give you a future and a hope setting the agenda for your future that's what I want to be speaking into tonight I mean this morning trusting that the spirit of God will give you understanding and that he will cause this word to break forth, to grow, and to breathe in your lives as you travel in life in the name of Jesus. Let me first say to you that it's my joy uh, to be able to speak to you at this point. When our chaplain was again introducing me and he said, he listened to me first in 1988 at Go Fest as a gathering of students. When the Lord Bishop said, when they were students, he met me in 1990. And there are so many people that God gave us opportunity to meet when they were students. And I just want to confess to you that the greatest excitement of my life and ministry is to meet men at their critical time. It's not that we don't preach. It's not that we will not meet people. But sometimes you meet people when their future are already finished. So you can preach to them and that's okay. But all you do is only to package them for heaven. There's not much you can do again. Because what is spoiled was already spoiled. And so, you can only look at them and say, Lord, whatever remains, please, can you preserve it? So we prepare and package such people to meet the Lord. We cannot prepare them again 
for a very very effective fruitful life because it is squandered already so when god gives me a privilege of meeting people young people who by the grace of god have a very big junk of their years ahead of them i do not take it for granted hallelujah i do not think it is a casual thing that god is addressing you now that you are young and i do not want you to think it was ordinary that god did not allow you to have entered into so many indelible decisions in life before he meets you if there's anything to thank god for i wish you would say lord i thank you for drawing me to yourself now that i'm young now that i have opportunity now that my days are no yes point but let's begin by saying the lord has a plan for you is that a big statement to say what did i say the lord has what a plan for you what kind of plan did god say he has plans for good for your welfare and not for disaster god does not plan disaster for any of you what does god plan for you he plans something that is good something that is wonderful he said to give you a future and a hope that will happen in the name of jesus christ can i also tell you the devil also has a plan for you i know you don't like to hear that but it's a reality that i must let you know about the devil also has a plan he has an elaborate plan for you he wakes up every morning thinking about that plans he plans very very elaborately how to arch that plans he has for you but if the devil were to speak if there was a bible written by the devil and there was a jeremiah 29 there you know what the devil would have said i know <laughs> the plans that i have for you plans for what for disaster <laughs> for sorrow for a hopeless future that's what the devil will have written in his own jeremiah 29 and as i'm telling you i am so aware of it i became aware of the plans of the devil very early in fact sometimes i could almost hear the devil discussing me every day say so you see this billy we know he's going to be great tomorrow we know if we don't catch him now he will destroy our work set traps for him do whatever you can to strike him don't let him escape because this kind of young man if he escapes our hand then we are in trouble I became aware of that 
I also used to say to the devil almost every morning. I also said to the devil, devil, you will not catch me. But I will do havoc to your kingdom. As the Lord liveth, in my lifetime, you will cry. And sometimes, I am aware of the takute, a trap that the devil will arrange. I'm aware of it. And sometimes, I will see it. I say, devil, I saw it. In the name of Jesus, I'm going on a long journey. You will not catch me. There were so many traps. Some traps are girls who sneak in into our fellowship as sisters. And it is Brother Gbile they are looking for. Because the devil keeps saying, I have a plan for you. Plan for disaster. To make you a shadow of what you should have been. To cut you short and make you an embodiment of regret all the days of your life. For the thief cometh not. But to do what? To steal, to kill, and to destroy. But I am come that they may have life and have it more abundantly. I am aware that there was a battle over my life. Sorry that I'm telling you about myself. Eh? The reason is because I felt this morning I must be speaking very clearly to you about setting the agenda for the future. It is not in the future you set the agenda for your future. When do you set the agenda for your future? Now. Those who made a mistake at this segment of their lives, they are the bundle of mistake you see on the road today. Those whose marriages have not worked. Are you hearing me? It was not when they married that their marriage cut out. It was now when they were making what? Their choices. Are we together, brothers and sisters? I was aware That why God on one side said, I know the plans I have for you. And I was so excited about the plan of God for my life. I thank God that I knew about it a bit early. Knew that God has a plan for me. I knew that God has, is taking me on a journey. It occurs to me that I'm going on a long journey with God. Some of my and colleagues and age mates who are moving together. And I remember that in one of those times, you know, as it used to happen when we were young people, we used to discuss, and we used to discuss the latest chicks that we will catch. When you see young men talking, you think they are talking something serious. No, they are discussing. So you see, I'm going to speak to Romke uh, tomorrow. You know, I say, Symbia, I want to talk to Symbia. So we are chatting, they are talking. And I remember one of the days, my friends, and I tell you, some of them are professors today, and it's good. One of my friends came and said, Billy, have you caught that one? I'm going to catch this one. 
and I remember. My friend wrote a letter to a girl and asked me to go and deliver it. <laughs> oh my God. Why God has a good plan for my life, I know Satan also has a plan. And he was working at it. I was to go and deliver the letter to this girl who my friend was going to be friend. But because the handwriting of my friend resembles my handwriting, I delivered the letter. The lady did not care to know who signed. He thought I was the one. And wrote me back and said, if that is what you want, I'll be actually waiting for you. Let's just begin. Let us just start. Now I have the problem of somebody falling in love with me and who ought to have been falling in love with my friend. So what am I going to do now? So I'm standing there. My friend said, have you delivered the letter? I said, I did. I delivered your letter. <laughs> Is he going to respond to me? I said, I don't know yet. Meanwhile, the girl is writing me and I don't know what to do. And one day I was praying and the Lord said, concerning that girl, it will be your dungeon. Get into that, you go nowhere again. Ah! That is one of those traps that are set for your feet. Be careful. I prayed and prayed and prayed. I said, oh God, I don't want to end it here. I don't want to end it in the village. The journey you showed me, I want to go with you, Lord. I don't want to end it here. I remember one morning, I took courage. I called the lady. I said, did you see the letter that I, I sent to you? I was not the one who wrote the letter Look at the name under it. I don't know why you are now writing me that I'm the one. She said, what? I don't like that one. You are the one I want. She was so tenacious. And God said, yes, that's your trap. How are you going to come out of this? I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, you will never have met me. You do hear me? You will never have heard anything called Brother Billy. I will have finished in one corner and finished very early. I know what God has done for me. The Lord will help you in the name of Jesus. I know the plans I have for you. Says the Lord. Plans for good and not for what? Not for evil. To give you what? A future and a hope. But the other man is also saying, I know the plans I have for you. And First Peter chapter 5 will quickly help you to understand how the Bible wants you to know about the plan. He said, be what? Be vigilant. Did he say something like that? Peter, First Peter 5. Will you read verse 8 for me? Be sober. Be, sober. be, vigilant. be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, is walking about, is walking about, is not stagnant, is going up and down, here and there, left and right, in and out. Doing what? Seeking. 
when we use the word to seek, what does that mean? Looking deliberately for searching digging about if he may find someone to do what? Do you know the meaning of divorce? What's the meaning of divorce? To tear apart mercilessly. To finish at once. Do you know that that's the devil? And he has special tastes, listen to me, not for old people. You know why? If the devil caught an old man and he tore him apart, there's not so much marrow that he can suck. Is it this one? In fact, sometimes I used to I used to think how the devil normally organizes his uh, demons. He gives them some matching orders. Oh. And when he says to them, he said, look, we are going on raid today. You know my priority. Those ones that are likely to cause us havoc tomorrow, catch them first. The ones that are already wounded, the ones that are already crippled, you can afford to leave them aside first. You will still fall on them because they can go nowhere. They are already crippled. But the ones that are priority, young men that are strong, young girls that are likely to become mothers in Israel, young men that may have a voice for God in the land in the coming days, catch them first. Do an indelible damage on their lives so that they cannot recover. And before their redeemer comes, damage them. And whenever you go anywhere, please, don't waste your time on those that we have already killed. We have already killed those ones. We don't need to worry about them again. They are already our prey. But these ones that are looking energetic and it looks as if there is, there is the eye of the Lord Almighty upon them. Do what? Catch them. It's a constant fight. Constant. You need to be aware of that. So Brother Paul said, we are not ignorant of what? Of the devices of the devil. So this morning, we want to now look how do I set the agenda for my future? Have, I, have you followed me to this point? Eh? Oh Lord, did you follow me to this point? Somebody is afraid of your future. Somebody is unhappy with what heaven has announced about you. I had serious, serious persecutions in those early days that used to worry me and say, God, why is everybody against me? Why is everybody talking against me? Even people that should have encouraged me, they say, go, 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 go away. And one day I was so discouraged, I was crying inside my room. I said, God, and God said, if you are not crit critical, Satan will have ignored you. You know, God has helped me a lot. He said, if not that you are critical, Satan will have done what? He will have ignored you. Does any hunter run after something that is not important? I said, no. God said, the reason why Satan is mobilizing persecution attack against you is because of what you carry. I said, did I carry anything? He said, you don't know. 
but they have seen it. So whenever temptation came to me, I stood up, I asked the devil, I said, devil, why can't you ignore me? I know I'm so important. That's why you are pursuing me. And in the name of Jesus, you will never catch me. Those were the prayers I used to pray. It became clear to me that Satan only runs after a man that carries weight. So when you are supposed to be great for God, then you have a great need to set a clear agenda for your life. I want us to do that together this morning. Can we do that together this morning? Hallelujah. We're going to read Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews 12. Hebrews 12 is a passage I know you know, but I perceive that the Holy Spirit will want me to approach it from this direction. Setting the agenda for my future. There are little, little instructions in that book. I know the one you will think I want to speak about quickly will have been the beginning of chapter 12, verse 1, when it says, let us run the race that is set before us. Let us lay apart, Abi, every weight and the sin which clings closely, closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Looking to Jesus, the founder and the perfecter of our faith. I will deal with that. But that's not where I want to start. I don't want you to get locked up in that. I want you to follow me because I really trust God that we will be setting an agenda. You know, I'm trusting that after this meeting, I may not see you uh, for another few years, but when I will be hearing of you, the glory of God will break forth on your life. I will meet you in higher places in the name of Jesus. We will still meet. We will still meet. I am sure by the grace of God we will meet. On this side of eternity, the Lord may allow us to meet. But I will not meet you as a dropout. You will not be hiding your face when you will see me in a few years' time. You know, there are some people that because they went and married an unbeliever, when they see Brad Gleason, I know Uncle, you, you, you will recognize me. And he will ask me, whom did you marry? So when they see me coming this way, what do they do? They go on the other side. And when I already know that they have already seen me and they are running away, if I want to pull trouble, <laughs> I said, oh, hallelujah I saw you, come, 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 come how are you and they know my question I first ask, how is your spirit that's the trouble so when they see me coming they would like to turn the other side but not for you in the name of Jesus Christ you will be happy to walk gallantly to come and say, Uncle, thank God, I am doing okay. But much more than this, I will see you in heaven. Yeah. When overcomers gather, you will be there in the name of Jesus. Yeah. Oh, trials dark on every hand, and we cannot understand. Or oh, the way the Lord will lead us to the blessed promised land. We wonder why the test, why we try to do our best. We will understand it better by and by, by and by, by and by. When the morning comes, when the saints of God are gathered home, we will tell the story how we overcome. We will understand it better by and by. When overcomers gather, you will be there. 
So the Bible began, and I want you to start with me quickly. I want you to start from verse 5. I'm dealing with setting the agenda for your future. We are going to take these verses very quickly, seriously. And I'm praying that it will settle in your mind. Verse 5 says, Have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord. And not be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. That's the first agenda. Any man that ought to be great for God cannot be left untamed. Untamed animals are the wild animals in the bush today. Are we together? Untamed animals, they are the prey of wild hunters today. Undomesticated animals, they are the ones that stray bullets bring so quickly into the hunter's net. When God has received a man, when God has determined to make you great, when God has decided that there's a future for you, today, you know what he does? He begins to train you for that. He begins to chastise you for that. He begins to do what? To trim you for that. He begins, you know, are you getting the word I'm using? He trains you for it. He trims you for it. Huh? He promotes you for it. He polishes you for it. He files you for it. Have you seen what we call file? Eh? Oh Lord, you have not seen that. You've seen the carpenters. You've seen the blacksmiths. You know, there's that rough iron. When they want to smoothen a rough edge, what do they do? They say, file it, file it. And then they apply serious friction up and down, up and down, up and down until the surface becomes what? Smooth. When God plans to make you great, what did I say he will do now? He will trim you. He will train you. He will cut you. He will file you. There are some certain dimension of your life now that is oversized for where God is carrying you. So what will he do now? He will chop you. He will come with his very, very sharp scissors and say, cut that extra shoot out. Does he pay? Yes. Yes. Does he bleed? Yes. One day I was crying. I said, God, why are you cutting me like this? He said, it takes bleeding to be a blessing. Any man that is afraid to bleed Are you understanding? Can never become a blessing to his generation. Oh. The agenda for the future, a future that has hope, a future that will be glorious, a future that will be effective, a future that will be celebratable. 
When God has accepted the man and said, this one, I'm going to use him for my glory. He focuses on him. He focuses discipline on him. He focuses chastisement on him. He focuses training on him. He focuses filing on him. Oh God, he focuses on him. He may allow others to go because they are not critical. But not you. Others may, you cannot. How many of you will like for God to begin to set your future in shape? Let me see your hand up. I know I'm talking to the right people. God bless you. God bless you. Can I tell you something quickly before I leave that? Ah, my God. You know, we were all in fellowship like this. And we used to look at one another. And I used to compare and compare and contrast myself with other brothers. And sometimes some brothers would do something. And when I look at it, I say, but God, this is the brother. We are all Christians. And we are all in the CU together. Why do you allow him freely to do that? And when he comes to me, you hit my head. Ah! And the Lord said, do you know where he is going? Do you know how long he wants to travel with me? Face what I'm doing with you. And sometimes, even in the midst of Christian brothers and sisters, God focuses on you. And deals with you in a way that he does not deal with the sister who is your roommate. God setting the agenda for your future begins to be meticulous about what he disallows in your character. What he will not permit in your own situation. And he may permit it in other people's lives. Others who live in the permissive will of God. And he can even be giving them food. And you say, Lord, how can you say you have a plan for me? Plan for good and not for evil. And it is me. You are treating like this. Oh God. And the Lord will say, the son that the father receives is the one he does what? He chastises. But if you are a bastard, if you are the one that has no stake, in my family program. If you are the one that I don't mind even if I miss you. I will not bother you. I remember in one of those discussions with the Lord. It became so serious. I came to that point. I said, Lord, it's too much. The way you are dealing with me is too much. And then the Lord said, so you want me to leave you? So that you can grow muko? Eh? And you want to be great for me tomorrow? If I leave you now, someone else will gladly catch you. I said, who is that somebody? The other person who has an alternative plan. You cannot understand the prayer I prayed. Can't. Because I don't think people like you pray such prayers nowadays. I think the general prayer I hear you pray now is bless me. Eh? Give me something. But that my prayer was Lord, 
since there is no other way you can take away foolishness from my life unless you pound me very well so lord pound me lord put me in your mortar and do what pound me until every wrong thing is out break me until i become smooth enough and flexible for your molding father roast me roast me until every rawness of my life disappears lord don't mind my tears those were my prayers i used to tell god i said lord it is natural for me to cry but don't mind what my tears even as I'm weeping, I will obey you. I have decided to be whatever you say you will make me. So Lord, even if I cry, don't mind my tears. I don't know how many of you will like to pray such prayers with me this morning. You are afraid, Abby? Praise the Lord. We are setting the agenda. Any child that wakes up in life to be pampered will only end as a puppet. Are you hearing me? If you enjoy pampering, you are rooting to become a very cheap, a very cheap pray in the hand of him who has the alternative plan. Any of you that anytime God confronts you with something serious in a particular fellowship, you say, well, this place is too tough, they are too serious, I don't like what, they, I don't like what they, the president is emphasizing, that I'll go to another place. And you move to another place. We had the pamphlets. <laughs> we can see all over you the glory of the Lord. They have not seen anything. They've not seen the devil that want to eat you raw. And you can be there in the crowd. You will never become anything. I know the plans that I have for you. Plans for welfare, not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. Now, if God has a plan for a man's future, he sets that agenda. And the first agenda is the agenda for your training. The agenda for trimming. The agenda for polishing. The agenda. It will appear like discipline. It will appear like chastisement. But no, it's an agenda. I'll tell you now. What will be the result of that first agenda? Let's read. Let's read. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as what? Sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline in which all have participated, then you are what? illegitimate children are not sons. Old King James says you are bastards. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to who? To the father of spirits and live? They disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them but he disciplines us for our good. That we may share what is holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. But later, it yields what? The peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. 
That's the first agenda. Agenda for my future. And any of you that you hope to be a voice for God tomorrow, where do you report first? Where do you report first? You report for this first agenda. Agenda for training. Agenda for trimming. Agenda for policy. Agenda for discipline. Agenda for chastising. Agenda for filing. I use all such words. I use it deliberately. You will notice that I did not say agenda for blessing. Eh? I was deliberate. Oh. I hope you are not scared. Are you scared already? Friends, are you scared? He said, no, no, I don't like this kind of mess. I thought he would just bless us and just say, God, son, you, I just see the great days ahead of you. I just prophesy. All such prophets that prophesy to you, they are soothsayers. What do I call them? Who is a soothsayer? A soothsayer is someone who says what suits. A soothsayer says something and he says, yeah, 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 hallelujah. That's not what God says to a man that he wants to make great. When God plans to transfer you and transport you into greatness, he takes you. That's the first agenda. If we miss that agenda, we give the devil opportunity to make you a cheap prey. God forbid in the name of Jesus Christ. Are we together? Now, you know we were singing, God will build his church. Abi? Say, so I will build my church. But do you know that according to scripture, the building of the body of Christ that God has promised us that you are singing about, and I was happy to be part of that song. The building of the church that God is looking for is not with, is not with chaff. It's with lively stones. Eh? Lively stones. First Peter chapter 2 said, you have been built together as lively stones. Jesus Christ himself being what? The cornerstone. But according to the word of God, the pillars, the stones, the elements by which God wants to build his church are men and women that have been caught to shape. So in 1 Kings chapter 6, will somebody quickly run and read 1 Kings chapter 6? I'm dealing with agenda for my future. God is going to help me to settle you into that very quickly. Yes? Stand up and read. Let's hear you. Quickly, verse 7. In building the temple, only the blocks dressed at the quarry were used. No hammer. No hammer, no chisel, or any iron tool. Uh -huh. All right. Where is good news? Yes. The stones with which the temple was built had been prepared. Where? At the quarry. Yes. So that there was no noise made by hammers, axes, or any iron tool as the temple was being built. Many people want God's work to be done. But they do not know that the first sight, the first sight 
before the temple site, there are two sites. What is the first site? The quarry site. Before the temple site. All the stones that were used in building the temple at the temple site, they were what? Prepared, dressed. Where? At the quarry. So that when they brought the stones from the quarry, having been dressed there, having been caught, when they came to the temple, no noise. No hammer. No chisel. Every stone that will be used at the temple site have been cut to shape, to size. So that when they bring this, they, 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 in fact, they gave the dimension to, to the quarry manager and said, we will need 20,000 three by four by two trapezium that we are going to fit at the corner of the temple. And so the quarry manager prepared the stones. Now, how many of you ever gone to any quarry before? Let me see your hand up. Have you ever passed by quarry? Eh? We are breaking stones. Is that a very quiet place? What do you notice there? Very terrible noise. Because as the stones were, were going through the machines, the stones are crying, yeah, 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 you, 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 yeah, ra, 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 yeah, ke, re, ke, re, ke, re, ke. Some stone will be jumping out. But the quarry manager is so focused, said, no quarry, no glory. No quarry, no glory. If you don't pass through this machine, you have no space where we are carrying you. If we don't cut you to shape now, you will not have shape down there. What is the agenda for the future for me? The first agenda. The quarry. Where the law cuts men to shape. Do you plan to serve God? Eh? Do you want to be part of the glorious end time ministry? Do you want God to put you somewhere where his glory will be breaking forth? Do you want to fit into the future plan that God has for you? The first agenda. Agenda for training. Agenda for trimming. Agenda for preparation. Agenda for polishing. Agenda for cutting. Agenda for filing. And where does this agenda take place? At the quarry site. It is at the quarry that all those that will have space in the coming days are made. May the Lord give you courage to pass through your quarry. Can I inform you that when you go to quarry site, there are some stones that could never be used. The reason is because why the machine was cutting and was shaping those stones deliberately, what did they do? They jumped out. So you will see them. They are on the periphery of the quarry. They are too afraid to go through the machine. They are too afraid to pass through God's training. And because of that, forever, they shall only be hand clappers. They will only be admirers. Are we together? They will only be onlookers. They will stand by the side. They will be seeing the glory of God in the life of their age mates. They will be hearing how God is using their friends. They may go and say, let me go and see whether it's my friend. But they will be in the crowd. And unless God helps them, they may go nowhere more than that. 
Can you take a decision with me this morning? That agenda for my future, I must not miss it. I didn't hear you saying it. Lord, help me to go through it. Now that I am young. I see many people struggling in the work of God. I see them, they want to do something. I can see them fighting. There's a lot of noise. There's a lot of hammer. There's a lot of chisel. There's a lot of iron tool. Iron hands. That's my ministry. No. Those who have gone through quarry, they don't quarrel with anybody. The reason is because the shape that I was caught to fit is unique. Even if you rush to the temple wanting to take my place, when you get there, eh, your chest will be too wide. When your girl eh, oversized me, did you go through the quarry? Sir, no. I can't be wasting my time there. Ah, sorry. There's no space for you. So this place here, Brother Gwilinia prepared for. It's coming. They may be there in front of me, oh, struggling, struggling, struggling. When I arrive, the temple manager will say, hey, Jeff, I, if I see give space for Brother Gwilin. Are you any here? You can't take my space. I have a space. In the plan and purposes of God, you can't take it. Do you know why? While I went to the quarry, I was caught for that. What have you been caught for? What is God courting you for? What is the Spirit of God preparing you to fit into in the plan and purposes of God? That's the first agenda. Let's go on quickly. We are back now at Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 12. If you are there with me. Verse 12, 13, 14. I will not spend time there because I would have loved to end with it. But let me read. Therefore, Lift up, lift your drooping hands. And do what? And strengthen your weak knees. Make straight paths. For what? For your feet. So that what is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. Strive for peace. That is, follow peace with everyone. And holiness without which no man will do what? We see the Lord. That's the next agenda. What is that agenda for? What is that agenda for? What is the agenda for personal holiness? What is the purpose of that agenda? Agenda for personal what? Holiness. Now let me first describe to you the misunderstanding that many people have about holiness is about rules and regulations. They think anybody, whenever you want to talk about holiness, with don't wear this, don't eat this, don't stand here, don't do that. Turn like this. Turn your hair like this. Don't rub pomade. No. Excuse me. That's not the issue. When we were growing up, some of us were confused. We thought holiness means hollowness. We imagine that if you are holy, you must be hollow. We think that holiness does not allow anybody to smile. 
And if you laugh too much, you have lost your holiness. So we are doing like this. Even though you want to laugh. It was cumbersome. This was mammoth holiness that has no benefit to anybody. It only made men legalistic. And so it made so many people to discard personal holiness as if it is a bondage. And so sometimes I see so many people in our time, they say, yeah, no, 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 don't bring this kind of holy, holy to us. Oh. The Spirit of God has called us to liberty. And wherever the Spirit of God is, there is what? Liberty. Liberty. And you know the way we talk then is liberty. And liberty meant license to misbehave. No. May I tell you a secret? You want to know the secret? Because there's only one weapon that the devil has discovered. Not two weapons, only one. The weapon the devil has discovered and it has worked for him. To bring any man, no matter how great he is, it will bring him to become a piece of bread. It's a question of sin. Listen to me now. Do you know why the devil always tempts you with sin? It is because sin is the most effective razor blade that cuts a man from God. Hear me very well. Maybe you don't understand. Sin, no matter how high you are, sin will cut you like this, shake and brought you down. Sin will turn the eyes of the Almighty God away from you. If God wanted to help you before, when He sees iniquity in your life, what happens? If God wanted to hear your prayer before, when sin comes, sin will just like, appear like a very thick black blanket to cover the eyes of the Lord, not to see you. Now, why does it you sin? Let me tell you now. It is because if God be for us, who can be against us? So the devil knows that the only way in which I can conquer this man is if I can create an isolation between him and his source of power. Every sin seeks to do what? To isolate you for slaughter. If you see a pastor beginning to sing, ha, yeah, 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 he's finished. He's been isolated for what? For slaughter. So the reason why the devil you see sin so much. I don't know anything else that the devil has used that is so effective for him. It's because sin will put you at loggerhead with God. Once God sees you living in sin, he will mobilize his power to fight you. That's why all the men that will have been great for God Sin cut them short. So, when you have an agenda for future, are you hearing me? It is not in the future that you must overcome sin. When must you overcome sin? Let me tell you, sisters, are you hearing me? You know, the temptation so sin is usually very, very, very high at this age when we are young. 
I will tell you a reason. All of you, are you hearing me? If to say sin comes to a man's life once and goes away, it will not have been a problem because if you sin once, it will leave you. But every sin, are you hearing me? Comes to addict. It comes to enslave. If you have never told lies in your life, thank God. The day you begin to tell lies, I want you to hear me. You will start telling lies as what? As an addiction. Suddenly you will not just know why. You can't just tell anything straight anymore. Some young men, they thought that they could just peep into pornography. You just say, just for this once. The devil will not tell you that he wants you to be addicted. Just say five minutes. Do you know the truth of the matter is that you peep into that thing for five minutes. You are hooked. And if God does not come with a powerful hand, you are hooked for one week. Eh? Tell me. Is it one week? You are hooked almost for many years, if not for life. Why? Every sin comes to addict. So Jesus said, he who is committing sin is what? Is a slave of sin. Sin comes to do what? To enslave. Anything that comes to enslave you. So if I have an agenda to be a free man, an agenda to be a man that God can work with, an agenda for it to be a man that God will use and God will stand with me. I may not have money, but I have God. I will walk boldly and say, I'm not alone. Jesus is with me. Oh, I am not alone. If I want to be a man like that, now that I am young, what will I do now? I set an agenda for what? Personal holiness. Personal holiness is not fellowship holiness. Personal holiness is not so that the fellowship brethren can accept you or put you in their school. No. Personal holiness is my personal need. I need to be personally holy so that Satan does not poke nose into my affairs. Are we together? I need to walk in personal holiness so that I can see God regularly. Anytime I want to see God, I can see God. Anytime I want to talk to God, I want to go home and say, Father, there is this challenge that I'm facing. And God says, yes, we will handle it. Anytime I want to have fellowship, I need personal holiness as a way of life. So now, I tell you now, if you did not cultivate personal holiness now that you are young, you are not likely to get it when you are old. Are you hearing me? You are not hearing me? Have you seen those big men, sugar daddy? They drive their car to campus and they pick girls that were your mates. And you know that this man has children on campus like you. And they will still take a girl who was their daughter's mate and they are going with him. How did he become like that? He has been addicted to it since when? When he was young. Why do I ask you that the next agenda is that agenda for personal victory over sin? Personal holiness. He said, pursue peace with all men. And what? And holiness. Sisters, brothers, young men, let me tell you, 
you are not being holy for your parents. Please hear me. When I talk to a young I say, <laughs> say my daddy is too difficult. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I say, ah, you don't understand. It's not your father. Who. Don't be holy for your father. Don't be holy for your mother. Be holy for who? For yourself and for your future. Agenda for your future. If it's going to be glorious, you must have passion for personal victory over sin. This is not what somebody should be preaching to you. This is not somebody, something somebody is saying, eh, you have to be holy, you have to be holy. Even though the Bible says, be ye holy for I am holy, I pray that you will see the blessedness of holiness. I'm going to be praying on your behalf by the grace of God, but I wish to say to you, this agenda for my future it is not in the future I will set it you know when we battled to become victorious was when we were like this that was when we said no if I fail now I will be a victim for the rest of my life don't be a victim do not do what be a victim. Are you struggling with immorality? You must win it now. Don't immorality, don't let immorality <laughs> overcome you. Not only that you will fornicate once. No. All the young ladies that started fornicating, you ask them. They thought it would happen only once. No way. Once you enter, it's, it's an addiction. Sin comes to enslave. Don't ever try to drink alcohol. The day you start, you will never stop. Don't ever, ever allow any young man to be exploring your body with his dirty hands. Once you start, even when you are alone, something will just be moving you because you are already addicted. You will be going near him and say, oh boy, how are you now? How are you now? The, girl, the boy will say, should be you say I should not come near you again. You say, is that why you are trying to, to get annoyed? If I told you not to come near again, is it not that uh, you should be careful? Eh? I still love you anyway. That girl is addicted. That girl will not be free. But I'm telling you, if we don't break that addiction today, it multiplies in geometric procession, progression as the days go by. The Lord will help you in the name of Jesus. What is the next agenda? I'm hoping that in your fellowships, when the Lord permits, we'll be able to trash some of this. Agenda for training is the first one, Abby. Agenda for personal holiness is the second one that we're able to treat this morning. The third agenda. And I would like to capture it from verse 15, 16, and possibly 17. See to it. That no one fails to obtain the grace of God. That no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble. And by it many become defied. See to it that no one is sexually immoral or unholy like Esau. Who sold his birthright for a single meal? For you know that afterward, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was what? Rejected. For he found no chance to repent. Even though he did what? He sought it with tears. 
agenda for correct valuation. You wonder why I want to put that as the third agenda. I'd like to put it there, and that will be the last one I could deal with. There are many things, but permit me to stop with that. Do you know the problem is this? If God does not help you to have a correct valuation for what God wants to make you, you can easily sell out. If you do not have a correct evaluation of what is important, what is crucial, and what is the value of what God is planning you to become, you are likely to mistakenly sell out. And so the Holy Spirit says, see to it that no one among you become like who? Esau. The story of Esau, I'm always not wanting to be tempted to read it because it's a pathetic story. Esau was born, listen to me, he was born to inherit the covenant and the promises that God gave Abraham, that God transferred to Isaac, and it was supposed to be Esau, who could have been saying the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Esau. That's what we should have been saying today. Hmm. Esau was a young man of great opportunity. Number one, I must remind you that he was a twin. And honestly speaking, that he came out first in a, in a, you know, in a, as a twin. And it's not that they were delayed twins because we were told that his brother was holding what? His hip. Which means they were almost coming out at the same time. If there's any little difference, it may be five minutes. But that Esau came out five minutes ahead of Jacob, he was to be his senior for how many years? Forever. Anytime they want to share anything in the family, they will say, Esau, take your own first and give your junior brother his own. He was going to be the heir of everything that Isaac owns. Just for coming out five minutes ahead of Jacob. What a grace. What a great privilege. What an opportunity. And they grew up. The Bible said they grew up, which means by the grace of God, they did not have congenital problems. They did not have spinal damage. They grew normally. God was sincerely preparing Esau to be what? To be first. Can I tell you another thing that touched me about Esau? God gave him a supernatural covering. He came out with what? With air on his, on his body. So when heat and they were living in the desert, his normal skin kept him warm. Are you hearing me? And when there's extreme, extreme heat, it didn't go into him. It was cool. It has a kind of bodily regulator that made him comfortable at all times. Very, very lucky man. Are we together? And because Esau was the firstborn of Isaac, everything that Isaac had, everything that Isaac can eat, everything that Isaac uh, has accumulated for years was going to belong to him. 
But can we understand what happened to brother Esau? What happened to Esau? Number one, the Bible said Esau became what? A man of the open country. He became a hunter. I was speaking over the weekend and I looked at Esau. I said, I don't know why a son of a shepherd who has many, many cattle and different animals in the house. If it is birds, they have fowls, they have all kinds. And if you want to eat sheep, there. If you want to eat a uh, cow, there. If you want to eat goat, there. I don't know how he, uh, he, he became what? A hunter. Hunting for what? For rats and for rabbits. Listen to me. May God give you understanding. When I noticed that he became a hunter, there's something about hunters that I noted that was already a wrong direction for his life. You know why? If a hunter sees a rat, what is in the mind of the hunter? Eh? To kill it and roast it. But if it's a shepherd, if a shepherd sees a rat, what will he do? He will like to capture it and do what? Domesticate it, feed it, knowing that this rat, if I don't eat it today, it could give me 20 rats in two months. Eh? What's the problem of Esau? Esau will eat what could have become a future for him. If a hunter sees a bed, a young bed that is just laying eggs, what will the hunter do? He will throw catapult and hit the head of that bed. Boom. Kill it. Roast it. Carry the eggs. Boil it. Eat it. If he was a shepherd, what will he do? He said, look at this bed. It's having eggs. Let me just cage it. Let me feed it so that it doesn't go anywhere again. And let it hatch all these birds for me. And in another one month, Instead of having one bed, I may have 15 beds. Who also will be laying for me? But Esau will eat his future today. How many of you are sitting here that you are eating your future today? Young sisters, am I, am I, are you hearing me? Do you know as a lady, you do not have unlimited eggs with which to produce children in your lifetime. Unlike boys, they have millions. That's why a boy, even at 60, at 70, he can still marry a young girl and have children. But you like this, you know that every month as your menstruation period has started and is coming, every month, you are releasing out of the limited quantity of eggs that you could have in life. You are releasing. And it will finish. When does it finish? Those of you that are reading uh, sciences. Eh? At menopause, your eggs are finished. Then I see you like this, washing off all your eggs. The one that could have become those that will make you great tomorrow. Ah! You allow a useless man to waste it. And you go for abortion anytime. And they flush you out like that. You don't know that they are flushing out your future. 
Some girls have become unfortunate. They have flushed out their uterus. At 18, you already have perforated uterus. How will you manage at 35? You have eaten your future. Esau was a hunter who killed his young future today. The Bible said, let none of you be what? A profane person. What do you mean of profane? A thoughtless somebody that don't think. Esau, when he went about hunting, he will sleep anywhere. He slept on the road. He will never come home. He will never attend family meeting. His life was just like that. Do you know only time when he comes back home? Whenever he is hungry. Whenever he is famished. So one day the Bible said, Esau came back from the open country. How? Famished. Famished. Exhausted. What did he exhaust his life upon? On crickets. Eh? And when he thought he would catch cricket, he caught copium. That gave him a terrible bite. And his hand was swollen for days. You know, when we were growing up, we were also following our uncles to go and hunt. And one of the troubles is that as you are pushing cricket or you are pushing a small rat, rats can dribble you. Then we will just fall. And the whole of your knee like this will peel. And blood will be coming out. What did we do immediately? We carry sand. To do what? To rub it. To rub it. We kept running. Can you imagine you adding tetanus onto open wound? That was the dangerous life some of us were living. If not God, who delivered us? Some of my friends, they are still in the village today. They couldn't go anywhere. That was what we were pursuing. And they missed their own destiny. Esau, he was a useless hunter. Are you with me? Are, are you with me? Then, one day he came back home. And Jacob, the junior brother, what was he doing? He was making, what did he say he was making? Porridge. Porridge. Ah, porridge. Just for it. And look at Esau. Let me tell you something. Esau is the senior brother. Am I right? Do you know that when Jacob finished making the porridge, if Esau just, just sat down, will it be reasonable for Jacob not to serve his senior brother? Eh? Since the porridge is from the family store. But because <laughs> Esau said, let's read what he said, because this may be important so that in praying, God will help us to pray well. We're in Genesis now, and chapter 26. Genesis. I think you should start 25, verse chapter 25 and verse 29. Once, when Jacob was cooking stew, Esau came in from the field. And he was what? He was famished. He was exhausted. And Esau said to Jacob, Let me eat some of that red stew. For I am what? I am what? 
I am fainting. I am famished. I am exhausted. Therefore, his name, what was his name called? His name was called Edom. That's why they gave him nickname. What is his nickname? Red Stew. Once he sees anything that is smelling red, I, Esau cannot go anywhere again. So all his colleagues call him Red Stew. I, will, I don't want to tell you how he arrived at that nickname. Because when they went on hunting, the, the, most, the most scarce commodity which hunters need on this, on, in the field is red oil. That's the most scarce commodity. You can get yam. Sometimes we will just pull out cassava like that and you roast it. But when you are roasting yam, dry, it's difficult to eat. You need what? Oil. Red oil. So when you see hunter begging for red oil, I know it. We used to do it. Say, Sheko Yeku, Sheko Yeku, your family dear. No, 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 no. You say, I'm not going home today. I, 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 we're still going for hunting tomorrow. And uh, this little oil, that's all remains. I will not give you. So sometime, the case, Agulu, and the small thing where we put red oil to Titan, what do we do? You carry it near fire. Put it on fire. Whether once more we drop, just to make your yam, at least to have a little lubricant. So when they call Esau, Mr. Edom, that's where his name came from. Rest you. So when he came home and he saw this boy cooking rest you, my God. See what he said. Are you there with me? Esau said to Jacob, let me eat some of that rest you for I'm exhausted. Jacob said, no, no, wait, brother. Cool down, cool down. He said, no, 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 now, 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 give it to me. He said, okay, sell me your bath right. Eh? Now. I'm asking. You know, in my mind, I say, here are two guys who, I think Jacob, he was a great planner. There may be many bad things about Jacob, but there is this one that I like about him. He saw a future. He knew that the future is in the above right. Am I right? Eh? <laughs> and he had been eyeing that. Because bath right, how could you get it? It is by bath. Esau was born first. He will have this bath right for life. And Jacob said, ah, what an opportunity. Let me offer to him. Maybe he will sell it. So he said, brother Esau, you want this rest you surely? You want it? He said, yes. In fact, I need it badly. Say, if you need it badly, can we make a bargain? Say, what, what, what? Can you sell me your bath right? And I will give you a spoon of rest you. Did you understand? My God. If I were the one, I would have asked him, that I senior you even for five minutes, you cannot cut that. How do you expect me to sell that to you? Mm -mm. Jesus said, of what use is my birthright to me? I need the stew now. And you know, Jacob was a very clever boy. He quickly brought pen and paper. I Esau, Edom, Isaac. <laughs> e. E. Isaac. I hereby sell out my birthright and all appurtenances thereof. 
whether in lands or in life, I hereby wholeheartedly sell out my birthright to Jack, Jack, Jegudu Ragudu Jacob, Isaac, <laughs> JJ Isaac. Upon the exchange of this one spoon of steel, signed E. E. Isaac. He had strength to sign. That's a man that said he was fainting. Was he really fainting? And as he handed the paper back to Jacob, Jacob handed to him what? A spoon of pottage. Jacob said, swear to me now. Because you know, Jacob was a very, very clever man. What did he say? Swear to me now. Let's, you see, don't just sign. Eh? Swear. So I hear Esau saying, and I hereby swear in the name of God Almighty, the Father in heaven, that that which I have exchanged to my brother Jacob, I will never take it back. Signed, second signature, E. E. Isaac. When he did, Jacob gave him bread and lentil soup. He ate and drank and rose and went his way. Thus, Esau, what did he do? Despised his birthright. Can I ask you, friends, what will make you exchange your future? Some of you are looking at me here. Is it because you have a need of 5,000 naira? Just 5,000. And he looks so hard that I, I, I sent that to my mom and she did not send me anything. Do they want me to die here? That's why one young man walked by and he said, Susie, because you are Suzanne. He said, I'll call you Susanna. He said, Susie, what's going on? What's up? He said, leave me alone. Don't even like my life. I wish I died. Ah, the young man said, for what? He said, can you look at me? I've been calling my mom to send me something so that I can at least make up for this weekend. And she's not doing anything. If I die, let me just die. And the young man reached his hand around your neck. He said, Susie, how much do you need? Just tell me. I'm surprised that you're still worrying your mom for something like 5,000 while I am here. Eh? <laughs> this is the only reason why we, we exist here. What is the purpose of friendship? Stop warning old woman in the village. We are here. If it's 5,000, no problem. I'll give you that. It's just that uh, I forgot my ATM card. I forgot it in the house. I would have just walked you to the, to the ATM machine and just punched, and then you get the 5,000, anything else you need. But if you don't mind, just come. I will be back from lecture at 7. For, for 5,000, you sold out the flower of your life. When the boy has got the better part of your life, he gave you 5,000. You spent 5,000. It is already finished. 
But your future is lost. What are you going to do about that? Esau did not regard the future that God has for him. He did not think of the glory that God was planning for his life. He did not think it's a great value to inherit Abraham, to inherit Jacob, I mean to inherit Isaac, and to be the father of many nations, and through him all nations of the earth will be blessed. He didn't value that. Just for a spoon of red stew. I dare some of you that just for somebody to add Mark. And let me ask you, if you already have 39, what can they add to you than to push you into 42? What is the difference between 42 and 39? I can hear one of you say, very much, very much. 39 is F, 42 is E. Only people that don't think of a future think like you are doing. If you are planning to be great tomorrow, let me tell you, for you to be getting 42%, you are already finishing a future because who will employ you? If I were you, I would have told myself, I'm still, too, I'm still young. I can go back again and regather my life the way I want it to be. I cannot patch up with 40, 41. Now that I'm young, I will not do that. But Esau had no eye for the future. He consumed his future at the moment. What was it that made him to do that? He was in haste. He only always responded to the immediate pressure present pressure was more important than the future to him. This morning, agenda for your future. I said the third agenda, setting a correct valuation on the future that God is setting for you. What do you want to become? What are you planning to be? And Jesus says this morning, let nobody among you be a profane, a toddler person like Esau. Let me finish with that Bible verse. Hebrews 12. Go back there. 12. And see what was the agony of, of Esau. What was his agony? Can you get it there? For he sold his birthright for a single meal. For you know that afterward, excuse me, what's the meaning of afterward? Eh? Later on. Can you tell somebody there is an afterward? Though? After you neglect, there's an afterward. I'm not hearing you. Life does not end in unilag. Don't bury your destiny in Unilag. You are passing through this campus. Don't make it your burial ground. The Bible said you know that afterward when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no chance. Another version says he had no place to repent. Though he did what? He sought it with tears. If you want to weep today, are you hearing me? Weep today. So that you can smile tomorrow. It is of no use to you to smile today only to be faced with a future with tears. 
Don't let anybody give you a temporary pleasure today at the expense of the treasure of your birth rights. So what am I saying to you as I conclude? Setting the agenda for your future. If there is no afterward, I would have said, live your life anyhow, go anywhere. But you are too young to be crippled. The way I used to think is this. If somebody who had lived his life up to 60 years or 65, are you hearing me? He has delivered all his children. He has gone all through the school. He has got all his degrees and certificates. And he has built his house. If suddenly he had an accident and he got paralyzed, I know it is bad enough. Am I right? But it's not too bad. Because even in his paralysis, he has children to carry me around. In his paralyzed condition, he has a house to stay. In his paralyzed condition, some people will serve him. But let's imagine that at 19, something happened. And your spine was destroyed. And you were paralyzed. And the whole of your genitals were wasted. How do you manage that? When you hope to live up to 70 years. You are not talking to me. What gratuity are you entitled to at 19? Hey, damn alone now. Children, answer me. That's how I think. If an old man had accident and he was paralyzed, it's not bad. Even though it's not good. But that's not, <laughs> that's not too bad. At least he has something to fall to. But if a teenager or at early 20, you got paralyzed. So that you have become totally unproductive. You are now like vegetable to yourself. How will you manage the next 50 years paralyzed? I tell myself, I'm too young to be crippled. So when all those temptations were coming on my way as a young man, I kept reminding myself, I have a dream for my life. I have a dream for my life. My life will not waste. I have a dream for my life. That was my song. I composed it for myself. I normally compose songs for myself. Eh? I used to be a member of choir, but it's a long time I sang in choir. But I still sing for myself. And I, I look for some little, little song singing for myself. Eh? As I'm going and I see temptation, I say, <laughs> my life will never waste. I have a dream for my life. I waste her. My Jesus. Now that her, I am young. I will remind myself. I say, look, brother. If I say an old man, don't say, lanku, lanku, hey, hey. I will go near and say, Baba, can I help you carry something? He say, oh, she, oh, man, oh, man. When you see a young boy, do you go near him? There's no compassion in your heart to help him. Because the one to help him is to want to help him for the rest of your life. Will you abandon your journey to be helping a man who is doing like this at, at young age? No. Excuse me. You are too young to be crippled. You are too young to be paralyzed. You are too young to be amputated. The agenda that God has for you is said, I know the plans that I think for you. They are plans for good and not for evil. To give you what? An expected end. 
But I know the devil also says, I know what I'm planning for you. Plans for disaster. And, and hopeless future. Where you will cry, 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 and I will laugh at you. That's the language of the devil. And having heard the two of them speaking to my ears, I decided that I will hold God. I will follow Jesus. It cost me a lot. I lost friends. Some say I was a fanatic. Some people abused me. But it didn't matter. You may abuse me today because you don't know where I'm going. When I become what God wants me to be, you will be one of those who will come forward to shake hands with me and say, Ah, Bragule, we didn't know that that's your plan. And it has happened. And I see it everywhere I travel to. This morning, I'm going to ask you. Jesus said, I have a plan for you. The first thing I want to ask you to do today is to bring this life, yours, now that it is still good, now that it is not scattered, now that the enemy is only just digging around it, he has not got any fire with you. Bring that life and let's hand it over to Jesus. Let's say, Lord Jesus, agenda for my training in the quarry site of discipleship, where you cut your mesh, you know, to fit. Take me there. Lord, don't let me hate your discipline. Don't let me detest the discipline of the Lord. I want to follow you. Agenda for personal holiness. Lord, I want to pursue personal holiness, not for the fellowship, not to please the church leaders, not to even fit into the colleague of holiness preachers. No. I want to be holy because Holiness is my weapon of becoming what I'm supposed to be. I don't want to become addicted. I don't want to be a slave to sin. I don't want the devil to isolate me for slaughter. I don't want him to take advantage of me and make me a victim in my youth. Lord, no way. Agenda for personal holiness. And all of you that are struggling quietly inside, this morning, Jesus is passionate. I feel that it is God's will that we will speak to you this morning and say, let's set the agenda for the future. And it shall be great for you in the name of Jesus Christ. Now, what does Jesus say? He said, come. I will walk with you. I will hold you. I will not leave you. I will not forsake you. Put your hand in my hand. One of those songs I was singing to myself. I didn't compose it for the church, but the church is singing it today, and I'm happy that they sing. But it's for me. I sang for my life. I put my hands in your hands, oh my God. That's what I said to God. I put my hands in your hands, oh my God. I put my hands in your hands. Oh my God. I shall not fail. For Jesus never fails. I did that in the early 80s. When I was setting agenda for the future that God showed me. I saw many of friends of mine, they are, they are moving like this. I said, Lord, I put my hands in your hands, oh my God. My hand is still in his hand up till now. I'm going to ask any of you this morning, will you put your hand in that hand? It will lead you into correct marriage. It will lead you into correct career. It will take you through all the ups and downs. It will set you on course. And because he never fails, you can't fail with your hand in his hand. Are you hearing me? Since he never fails, I don't see how I can fail with my hand. Where? In his hands. Stand up and let us pray together. Stand up. Let's quickly pray together.
father this morning because of who you are because of your great plan for these lives young men young ladies and even some of us that look as if we have grown a bit yet we are still young compared with where you are going with our lives this morning i ask that you will be gracious to us i ask lord that don't let the agenda of the enemy don't let it come to pass in the name of jesus christ what you say you have for me and, and these brothers and sisters is what must come to pass the future you plan for them shall be the future they will experience in the name of jesus lord as we talk to you now one by one as each one of them look inside and decide i will never be esau all the esau tendencies uproot it around me from now in the name of jesus lord as they will pray i know your hand will stretch upon them you will cause your glory to rest upon their lives this is only a one talk but i'm believing you that this one talk will help their lives and that in years to come they will remember that we have talked about setting the agenda for the future that you have spoken to us about and that none of them will be a casualty yeah. they will never be victims yeah. they will be victors yeah. their generation will celebrate them yeah. 